It's Comics Are Great, the visual storytelling show recorded live every other Wednesday at the Ann Arbor District Library in lovely downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. Comics.aadl.org. And this is the show where we talk about making comics, writing comics, designing comics, uh, creating comics, and all the stuff that goes around this medium that we love so much and the, the medium that drives us all insane. My name is Jersey Joe's cartoonist and teaching artist. And with me today is somebody I am exceedingly excited to talk to, uh, George O'Connor of olympiansrule.com. Hi, George. Hi there. George underscore O'Connor underscore on the Twitters. Yeah, all the other George O'Connors got the good ones. I got into Twitter early enough to, to snag, like, uh, you know, the, the first name handle. But in like, and I guess like, that's considered kind of like a, a douchey thing to do uh, amongst Well, them. you also have a fairly unusual name. In the United George States. George O'Connor, like a good Irish name like that, good Irish Catholic name. There's like seven zillion of us. <laughs> so there's no chance. I got the first Google Plus George O'Connor. I was so excited, and then it didn't take off. I'm like, well, <laughs> I'm always ready just to grab George O'Connor. Yeah, that, that's, that's something I do whenever a like, new social thing comes up. It's like, in case it becomes a thing, I better squat the name just so I can make sure that I yes. got it. But, uh, but anyway, so, you know, besides Twitter, we should talk about your credits, that you got a pedigree. You've done a lot of stuff. Uh, Journey into Mohawk Country. Yeah, yeah. A uh, centuries-old look at Iroquois life from a Dutch text, yes? Yeah, uh, Harman Meinders van den Bogart. He was a Dutch explorer. He wrote it in 1634 to 1635. And then we uh, used a translation done by Charles Gehring and William Starna uh, from, you know, modern day. And that's the only text. Wow. Pretty awesome. And then you did Ball Peen Hammer. Yeah. And Kapow, a kid's yes, book that you that did. Yes, that was my first picture book. Uh, New York Times bestseller. Uh, yeah. Actually, uh, all the books we're going to talk about today, uh, a lot of the books we're going to talk about today are, are bestsellers, right? So I should say... Olympians I, has been hitting it lately, luckily. That's been nice. Yeah, so we should talk about the Olympian series. Zeus, Hera, Athena, Hades, Poseidon, and coming soon, soon, uh, working on now, Aphrodite, right? Finished with Aphrodite, thank goodness. Oh, uh, you finished it. Congratulations. Yeah, that's the, the, the lead-in for these things is immense. But uh, I kind of pushed on this one. I only handed in, like, the last bit of Aphrodite, like, maybe two weeks ago. Oh, so, wow. So now... But, uh, yeah, that one's done. Now we're going to start working on Aries next. It, and we're going to talk about that. So the series, The Olympians, was described to me... It was first described to me by a friend as it's... Greek mythology, but played as straight up superhero, you know, straight superhero, right? Like not like uh, tongue in cheek, not uh, uh, you know, kind of stuffy textbook with superhero ish illustrations. No, it's like reading a superhero comic, a good superhero comic that happens to be about Greek mythology. Uh, and I think that that for the most part, that was a pretty accurate summation of this series. And we're talking about this a lot because there's a lot of a lot of good stuff in these books, George. Thank you. But I want to start, like, just like I did like last time with Callista, I want to start with a big, important question before we dive into uh, picking apart your work. We okay. Uh, He-Man. Can we talk about He-Man a little bit? Hey, let's do it. <laughs> He-Man plays an important part in all this, actually. So I was hoping you would say that because we're looking behind you right now. Looking at me. It, it, this is the studio of George O'Connor, and I'm seeing some. These are, oh, my gosh, the, the Maddie Collector line. I see King Randor. I see. Yeah, I got both versions of King Randor. Oh. The, uh, the Battle King Randor and the Pimp Daddy King Randor <laughs> comes with the wine glass. <laughs> and have, I see the Sorceress back there. Yeah, I have both versions of the Sorceress. I have the one from the cartoon and the one where she's wearing all white. Oh, wow. And uh, so, yeah, you got a, a, a Keldor is back there, if anybody's like a real He Man nerd. Uh, so, I have to ask before we go any further. Uh, yeah. You collect these toy lines. You got a pretty awesome collection there. Uh, Thank you. Do you it's watch one of my prides and joys. Do, do you watch the show too? Uh, no, you know, actually, uh, as a kid, I really hated the He-Man cartoon. Um, you know, when He-Man first came out, it came with those really great little mini comics. Yep. And these great people worked on it, like Alfredo Acala and like Mark Texier was one of his first jobs, and Bruce Tim, the guy who does like Bruce all the DC Tim. cartoons. Yeah. All these great things, and the cart the comics were kind of dark and cool. And I remember, like, the cartoon was coming. Me and my brother were like, this is going to be so awesome, this cartoon. And then, like, that opening bit where he manages this doof who transforms into, like, well, he doesn't even transform. He-Man, right? Prince Adam. Yeah. He's just the same guy with his shirt off and a suntan. 
It's like you see me at the beach. You're not like, who's that dude? That's like some new guy. Well, to be he fair. He even hung out with the green tiger both ways. It's like, come on. To be fair, George, he did have an echo effect on his voice when he was He-Man. So that <laughs> helps th 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 helps <laughs> yes, the disguise. Yes. Uh, well, <laughs> long-time listeners of the show are going like, oh, no, because they know that I'm a huge fan of the cartoon. <gasps> uh, really? But, well, but, 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 I like the designs. I'll say that. Except but, for Prince Adam. Hey, Prince Adam. We are oh. not going to argue about this because um, I, I totally understand everybody's uh, critiques of the show. And, and, and then my, my counter argument to the critiques is well, it is called He Man after all, right? It is a silly premise. But what I wanted to dig at is like the story around He Man because. One of the things that when I was reading the Olympian series and then I like did a little digging into, you know, researching you and I was like, oh my gosh, he's, he's got a huge He-Man collection. I wonder how much of that longtime affection for that franchise led to or informed sort of the decisions that you're making in the Olympian series because like there's so many parallels in, in, in certain senses like Soaring Adventure uh, with designs uh, ranging from muscly dudes in yeah, yeah. cloths to semi-anthropomorphized, you know, guys like Snout Spout or, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, Mecha Neck, where it's like there's this, I mean, whether you like the cartoon or not, even the, the characters' designs have this wonderfully elevated kid logic of, hi, I'm Mecha Neck, what do you do? I make my neck really long. How does that work, yeah. right? But we don't question that when we're kids. It's just like, cool, right? He could make his neck really tall. He could peek over walls. And, like, that's, when you look at Greek mythology... There's a lot of stuff like that in there. Like, for instance, like, oh, the Olympians were born in. Oh, they could change shape. Titans couldn't. Well, why could the Olympians change shape? Well, because they were the next generation. And they're magical Yeah, creatures. that's just what they do. That's what makes them cool. Yeah, just, so, like, there's, there's th that comparison. Uh, we got the blend of science and sorcery. You know, because in Greek mythology, you got Daedalus, who can, like, make anything out of anything. Yeah, you got Hephaestus with his robots and such. Yeah, yeah. And then you've got shape-changing magical dudes who turn into animals that, that, that kiss women all the time, right? <laughs> uh, you've got stories that teach young people about how the world works and how to behave in this world, right? So, like, yeah. Like, especially the He-Man cartoon, which this is one of the criticisms leveled at it that I... I accept, but I, I love it for this, is like, at the end of the episode, He-Man walks on and says, today we learned about courage, you know? Uh, yeah, here's, here's... you would have the little lessons at the end. Yeah, and, and, but, but the, the big idea is, like, you know, one of the things that when you talk about Greek mythology, like, when I first heard that about this book series and I hadn't read it yet, is I was like, oh, is it going to be stuffy? Is it going to be stuffy? You know, or is it going to play to that wonderful, elevated, soaring kid logic that things like He-Man have? I, I don't you... get how you can make Greek mythology stuffy. I was introduced to Greek mythology for the first time in fourth grade, and I was like a He-Man fan, right? I would always sit there in the back of the class drawing, like, I started drawing He-Man, but I, I didn't like He-Man as much as I liked the, the bad guys. I was really into Skeletor and Merman and, you know, Trap Jaw and Clawful. Clawful is my favorite, the crab guy. <laughs> yep. And uh, I would draw the monsters a lot, but I really liked drawing monsters, and I liked drawing, you know, I'd have muscle men fight them. When mm -hmm. I was a kid, I had the... Um, the Wonder Bread He Man, you know Wondar. He Wanda. was the mail order one. He was the He Man with brown hair. He was like more mean looking. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I do. So that was my default He Man. So he, but he was a generic muscle man. So I would always draw these muscle men fighting. We have uh, we have monsters. an image we can pull up while you talk about it. Actually, this I can is actually what... pull my Wondar off the shelf. <laughs> no, we got Hold an on. image of of I the drawings you did. We got an image of the drawings you did when you were a kid, uh, of these muscly guys fighting. Crazy yeah, monsters. so all right, here's the dude I was talking about, right? Wondar. With he's Zodax Eman, armor. But, you know, he's darker. Um, <laughs> but I used to draw all this stuff all the time. I was really into like the muscle men fighting monsters idea. Normally the monsters eating the muscle men. Fourth grade, we start studying Greek mythology, and it's like, oh my god, all this is is muscle men fighting monsters. But with elements of sex in there, too. Yeah. <laughs> so super duper exciting for me. And then I kind of get into comics through Greek mythology. Um I always had comics in the house. Like we had a lot of like Hulk and Spider-Man and Superman around the house. My parents were big comic readers, but it wasn't my thing thing until uh, my mom brought me an issue of Thor when I was sick one day, and it was uh, what, like just had a cold. But it was like Walt Simonson's run. Yeah. And it was like, oh my gosh, this is mythology, and that's when I became like a big comic fiend. So. Yeah, Simonson's run on Thor is magnificent, right? He captures. Uh, it still holds up. I have like right off, off camera. I have that brick that they like came out with the complete edition with all the recolored versions and stuff. 
Yeah. I mean, it hurts to read it. It lay there and it dents your chest. But man, <laughs> what a great comic. I, I recently started getting some of the uh, the artist editions of Simonson's uh, run on Thor, with it, where it's produced at the original art size, and it's like, yeah, and you can see the actual corrections and such. Yeah, um, yeah, so pretty, so cool. But but I mean, but yeah, he's got he captures all of that, um, all of the 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 epic, soaring, powerful hero kind of thing. Uh, but it still feels like you're, you know, like when he cuts to the scenes with Volstag and like like Balder's backstory and like Balder going to hell and all that stuff. It's you're still reading epic mythology, but he's not like the difference between writing like, you know, a bad. Well, actually, I'm going to quote you. You said this in an interview uh, a while back. I hope that, I remember it. Well, I'll read it to you. Uh, is that you said, you know, uh, superheroes are kind of like mythology when they're done right. Right. So, like, this idea that, like, you're not just focusing on, look at this awesome guy who could do with this awesome thing. It also has to have some kind of, uh, like, a, a powerful narrative to it that also kind of teaches us something at the same time. But though it's not didactic about it. Does that make sense? No, it totally makes sense. And, and like, yeah, that's, I, I think you could look at something like the way Simonson did Thor. It's a real, <clears throat> a real template for the way I try to approach stuff in Olympians where... Not only, like, the fact that he wrote some sophisticated stuff in there that I missed when I was a kid reading it the first time. Like, trying to write on multiple levels at once. And, like, you know, he has, like, that huge moments. Then he has these little touches of life. Yeah. You mentioned Volstagg, right? The Warriors 3 were my favorite characters in that. Because yep. they would, like, you know, Thor's off, like, fighting, like, the world serpent or something. <laughs> and they're always having their little kind of side details. They had that running thing with Volstagg where he had, like, just his family squabbles. It's like, this is great. Well, yeah, and there's like that, that he's telling stories about Balder to, oh, what is that? Um, oh, I'm getting some slap back from you again, George. If you could just like back away from the computer just a little bit there. Perfect. How's that? A little bit. I think. You know, I think my studio is actually a little uh, echoey. echoey, unfortunately. Let me open the closet, see if that absorbs some sound. Okay. How's that? Check, check, one, two. It's very faint. It's very faint, but uh, we, we, I think we can live with it. Uh, okay. But, yeah, I'll, I'll it's, just, to, uh... it's when you get excited and lean into the computer that my voice starts bouncing off your, your manly chest and comes back into the microphone. I am rather manly. <laughs> But yeah, like there's like the, yeah, like uh, Thor will be doing some awesome stuff with Beta Ray Bill in outer space and fighting, you know, uh, all sorts of different goblins and demons. And it cuts back to Volstagg, who's telling stories about Balder while sitting on what was it? Was it Ragnar? What was the name of that guy who was from Balder the Brave? He's sitting on his back. It's like, it's like yeah, this Ragnar. Ragnar. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Just, that, that weird plot of just oh no, did we just black out? No, I'm still here. Okay, I had a blip of blue for a second. <laughs> I still see you and hear you. Okay, good. So, but, but, uh, but yeah, like it, like cuts these co comical moments with Volstagg, right? And then cuts back to, uh, you know, uh, the awesome action. There's like, there's a good balance between the two things. Uh, and I think you got that in the Olympian series, uh, quite a bit, right? Thank I've got, you. I've got I some. I for it. Oh, well, I mean, we were talking earlier about like, okay, so, so the newest book, the one that's out right now is Poseidon. And yeah, it just came out. And uh, we'll go into more detail on it, but one of the, the one of the scenes in the book is the story of the Minotaur and Theseus and King Minos and how this whole problem of the Minotaur sort of comes about. And you know, one of the things that's really interesting that you deal with in these books is it's a visual medium, George, and this thing is, is supposed to be accessible to kids. And there's a lot of dirty stuff that happens in those Greek mythology stories. And so, like the you know, Poseidon's mad at Minos, so he's like, "Well, I got an idea. I'll you know make his wife consumed with lust for this this bison over there, this bull over there." <laughs> and then you got the scene where, and then what she does in the story is she says like, "Hey, Daedalus, make me a bull suit so I can go know this bull in the biblical sense, right?" Mm -hmm. uh, and you do this wonderful thing visually where it's like, okay. Here's the artist. He's he's got to he's got to draw this sequence. And let's see if I can pull it up. Um, oh, where did I put it? I know it's I know I marked it with a little tag in the book, but uh, you got this wonderful scene where you you show her on like the window's ledge, like like consumed with the the bull. Ah, here we go. Let's see if I can get it on camera. Uh, where is it? It's down. Where did I put it? Yeah, it's down here where it's just her hand resting on the ledge while she looks at the bull, and they're zooming in it for me. And then we cut to Daedalus, who's like looking over his shoulder like, all right, I'm making a bull suit, a, a cyber bull suit almost. <laughs> right, going back to that idea of like the, the merging of science and, and sorcery, but also you know, dealing with 
adult things in a visual way. That must have been hard, picking those moments and fi figuring out how to show some of these things in a way that's accessible to all readers, right? Uh, it's a challenge. I don't know if it's hard, but I've tried to, um, you know, I want, I really believe strongly in making comics that are all ages. Like, I get a lot of fan mail from people who are adults that read this, and I find that really rewarding, because I think, really, these are marketed mostly as kids' books. But I get happy whenever somebody, like, can really appreciate it on any level. So, but doing it all ages, you have to be a little careful about some of the more sexier aspects. Yeah. Um, it starts right at the bat with Zeus. There's a lot of stuff happening there that you have to kind of, like, it's aimed to go over a kid's head, but an adult can pick up on it. There's, there's, um, can, I'm trying to think ahead if I can actually phrase this without, there's, there's a little bit in Zeus that there's even a little bit of a dirty joke I got in there that most people don't catch, where he's, uh, he's talking with Metis, and in the background, you could kind of sense what's happened. Metis is, uh, Athena's mom. You can see that they're all kind of laying out. It's at night. There's a couple. There, you just passed it. Yep. There's a couple of women in the background. You can guess what just happened, and they're talking about the moon. And Metis goes, uh, well, he's talking about how he looks like he could hold the moon up in you know his hands. Mm -hmm. And Metis is like, I've met the moon. The moon's way bigger than you, Zeus. And he goes, I don't know. I could grow pretty big. Yeah. Goes, hey. Yeah. I, yeah, I caught that one. <laughs> <laughs> Very few people do apparently. It's really funny. I'm like, I got that in there. I was so excited. So there's pretty much one dirty joke in each Olympians book, but done in a way like that, where hopefully it's it's done tastefully. It's a nod to the you know these are racy stories, and uh, I hope that a kid won't catch that. They're just like yeah, Zeus can grow big. He grows big as a mountain. Right, right, yeah, yeah. That the, I think that you had that that double entendre thing in there, like tastefully enough. Like there was no point where I was reading the books going like whoa, whoa, you know. Uh, and, and that's one of the cool things about, about why I was so excited, is I think you were hinting at earlier, is like when you're reading Greek mythology as a kid, it's like it's speaking to that wonderful elevated kid logic while still yeah. hinting at stuff where it's, it's kind of like when I discovered, you know, like heavy metal magazine when I was a kid. And I'm like, I shouldn't be reading this. You know, like if you discover it when you're 12, it's like this is like older kid comics and that makes it all the more exciting, right? Yeah, I remember when I uh, I had a Savage Sword of Conan, and my parents bought it for me. I'm like, I don't think they realize there's boobies in this. <laughs> Kept it next to my drawing, my little drawing table, like for years. I literally had this one for years. It's like, oh my goodness. Uh, I want <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about the character designs in this too, because that was another thing that I was really excited about. Is like when they said, um, oh, I'm getting slapped back again, George. Let's see if we really? can. Really? Yeah. What if I talk this way? <laughs> I think it's it's me bouncing off of you. Uh, test, test, test. Well, if I sit sideways, what and if I do this? If he, if he, can we get that on camera map? We want to see all of his contortions. <laughs> yeah, the George O'Connor interview, just hiding. Yeah. <laughs> How's this? This is what I have to show for the video. Uh, can you hear me, George? I can hear you, yeah. Okay, good. Okay. That, that's, actually, that's actually better. All right. Uh, Let's strike a casual pose. <laughs> But the designs of the characters, you know, like when I heard superhero mythology, I'm like, oh, you know, it's like when we talk about Simon's, Simonson and how he finds a way to take those Kirby designs and, and like make them feel like they belong in this, in this narrative, uh, in this context. It's like, okay, is he going to do toga guys? Or is he going to do, you know, like, what's he going to do? Is he going to do costumes, right? Is, it, is the face this going to be wearing like a suit of like cyber armor? Does he look like Iron Man or what? And I don't know how you did it, but you found this way to make everybody feel like, and I guess, you know, it comes back to E-Man, where the characters all feel like they're supernatural super guys, but nobody's wearing, like, a garish costume. Uh, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I kept them pretty simple. I did, I remember reading one review where a person was outraged that I drew Zeus in an Athenian, you know, chitin. I was like, I'm sorry. I, yeah, in a perfect world, he'd be nude, and so would most of the characters, but you know what? that would kind of scuttle the whole idea of an all-ages thing. <laughs> right. um, yeah, I mean, I've heard it said, and I think it's totally true, really, superheroes are basically nudes, right? Mm -hmm. It just, you know, garishly colored, possibly because in the era when superheroes were created, there was like six colors you could do anyway. So you kind of had these nude figures who were just brightly colored. So I kind of take that same design sensibilities, which... You know, not coincidentally, kind of lines up very well with the classic depictions of these gods. Maybe not so much the garish colors. And I, I don't know that the colors are super garish. No, they're I, not. Tends to be a little bit bright anyway. 
Yeah. But, you know, none of the Olympians are super bright, I think. No, no, they're not. No, I was saying, like, they're not garish. That's the amazing thing about the designs that you found, is you found a way where Poseidon has, he's, like, just a little bit blue. He's not, like, bit, yeah. he's, he's not, like, the bright green of, like, a Martian manhunter or anything like that. Uh, but he's, he's blue enough that we go, oh, he's different from Zeus somehow, right? And you do, you do things with, like, the build of the characters. You know, Poseidon's a little bit more ripped than Zeus is, a little bit more, you know, chunkier. Have uh, you ever heard my reasoning behind that? No, I'd like to hear it. It plays on family dynamics. Uh, the big three brothers of Olympian mythology, it's, um, you know, Zeus is the baby brother, Poseidon's the middle child, and Hades is the older brother. And I have this little rule I've established that um, I'm an older brother of my family. I'm the oldest. If, like, my little brother was the god of the universe, like Zeus, it would kill me, right? I'd be <laughs> highly disturbed. So Poseidon and Hades both will always be a little bit bigger than Zeus. They could change shape. But if Zeus is, like, currently six foot, Poseidon's going to be six foot two. And if Zeus is 90 foot, Poseidon's going to be nine foot, 92 feet. He's always going to be a little bit bigger and then Hades, who you haven't seen with him as much, he's always a little bit bigger than Poseidon, too. It's like this uh, peeing match that they have, where it's just this little subtle thing they do. They all have the same general bone structure in the face, but I'm kind of playing with the family dynamics that way. Well, that, that kind of leads me to another thing that I had in my notes here that I think is really interesting. is something that I've read, that I picked up from reading the books, but then also in, in reading uh, interviews with you, is this idea of figuring out what each god's story really is. Now, I'm going to pull out a quote that I pull out a million times on this show. Ernie Cologne said what that. Uh, uh, Ernie Cologne is awesome. And he, he said, he had a great quote where he said, cartoonists don't simplify, they clarify, right? And so you're oh, taking... He's the one who said that. I've heard you say that before. Yeah, yeah. He said that in, in an NPR, inter uh, National Public Radio, NPR interview. Yeah, and, and so here I am. I'm holding a book, 66 pages long. And you're to tell the whole story of Zeus, right? And so the, the natural assumption might be is that, well, he had to simplify a lot to get to this point. But you have to clarify. And I'm wondering if you could speak to this idea of, like, clarification of the character's story. How do you figure that out? How do you find out what Zeus's story is? Huh. You, you talked about the family dynamic. I mean, that must have been part of the, the inroads of these guys. And, like, you talked about the new Aphrodite book coming out. And like, you said that, oh, she's an outsider. How do you find that yeah. out? How do you get to that? Well, you know, and the librarians will like this answer. One of the things is you read a lot. I read, I read, like, there's a picture that's on the inside of each of the Olympians' books of my head exploding. <laughs> it's like Athena jumping out. And that's kind of like, that's kind of my method of working here. I just read everything that I can find. I don't read retelling so much as I read, um, uh, like the original sources. I go back to anything ancient Greek, or ancient Roman, or anybody who actually believed in these gods. And you read these stories, and there's there's always these little elements that come through. Where, like you, you were talking about the great kid logic, and I agree that there's the kid logic there. But these stories weren't originally written for kids. It's more of like a a real basic human logic. It speaks through different cultures, right? And that's maybe why it seems like it's kids. It's not so much. Um, it's like a basic general truth. And they are a family. They base their entire idea of divinities on like the, the family structure. So it's a really great, there's this great quote from this book, um, uh, The Marriage of Cadmus and Harmony. I'm going to hold it up. One of my favorite books. I've, uh, I've talked a lot about this book in a lot of different places. And there's a line in here where it says that the Olympians were the first gods to, you know, eschew, you know, animal heads and abstractions and become human. It was the great experiment. And that's what the Olympians have. They have this, they're based on humans. It's the first time that any group of divinities was based on humans. And it gives them this richness of character. And you could put all these elements, the same way a superhero is a great archetype, the Greek gods are the same way. You can look into them and see all these different things about them. Did I answer that good? Yeah, yeah, no. I mean, like, I love this idea of stripping away the kid logic and saying that this is actually a human logic. It's kind of a dream logic, isn't it? Yeah. Like we're talking about metaphors that are informed by dream, if you want to get into the whole Jungian, Freudian kind of stuff. Uh, but, but the, like, in, in a visual medium like comics is so great for this because, like, when I was reading the book and I was looking at some of the images, like, for instance, your depiction of the Titans, uh, I thought, of course, of course that's what the Titans would look like. These gigantic, 
almost distorted, stretched out, mysterious. They're always shaded in black. Yeah. Uh, mis- you know, mysterious human forms. Um, and that, and that, that the, human, the humanization comes through in the narrative, but then it's with this wonderful dreamlike design work. Like, for instance, uh, uh, help me out with the, the pronunciation of these guys, the, the hundred-handed... Uh, the Hecatonkeries. The Hecatonkeries. Thank you. I tried looking. Great word. I love it. What What's awesome is your design for how to depict a creature with 100 hands. I don't know if we can get this on camera, but you put a hand on every fingertip. Yeah, they get fractal. Yeah, that's, that's such a great I, idea. You try drawing a character with 100 arms. It looks silly. It looks like he's furry. Right. Right. So yeah, like thinking of them as as having a, a fractal nature, and then the cyclops, the cyclopes too. You know, those guys. Uh, the design you came up with for them was really great. So you have this great marriage of the sort of dream logic with this kind of human tale. I, does that does that sum up? Yeah, I really enjoy. Zeus has that weirdness in it because I I very consciously like the first part of Zeus occurs before the Olympians are really born. And it's before the Olympian order, which is the, the period of us, right? We're the humans. We come about in the Olympian order. That's our time as well. So it's this kind of weird proto-human stage. So the Titans and the Cyclopes and the Hecatonchires and all those other creatures, I, the world was so much weirder in Zeus. And now it's become a little bit more like what we think of the Greek world in the other volumes. And I'm kind of sad because I think I've exhausted all the Titan myths. I like... I. I've managed to shoehorn in a picture of the Titans in every volume so far, and I'm pretty sure I'm going to do it in every single volume. Because uh, I love it. I love drawing the Titans. They're awesome. And kids all the time will be like, what are you going to do books about the Titans? I'm like, I have to make stuff up. There's not much more to tell about the Titans. Like They have like a couple big myths, and I've already done them. I, I love this. I love what you did with the, the abstraction, too, with how the hair is like clouds. Like the hair. Kind well, there's of- an actual line. I think it's in Hesiod where it, they were so tall, their head, the clouds mingled with their hair. I'm like, well, screw that. They're going to have cloud hair. Yeah, yeah. It's just the way it's good. They're kind of, uh, part of the way that they were designed, um, I was going through the history of Greek art a little bit, and they're supposed to be indicative of, like, some of the early vase painting and type things. And then the Olympians are kind of like the marble statue stage. I kind of got away from that, but that was part of the original inspirations when I designed it. Let's see if we can get, like, here's a shot of, of Kronos sitting on the mountain, and yeah. Yeah, he's so fun to draw. Yeah, and you do all this great force perspective stuff where to really emphasize, like, the, the true, you know, size of this guy. Uh, but yeah, Kron- Kronos and Rhea are standing there with their hair-like clouds. Uh, so, yeah, the, uh, the other thing that, you know, you mentioned Simonson earlier, and it's funny that you brought him up, because, like, when I was reading this, I was like, this feels very Simonson-esque to me in the in both like the the kind of like the energy and uh, there's even a in Zeus in particular there's one panel which is a direct reference to a Simonson panel that was like my favorite thing. Uh, uh, let me grab my copy. Is it, uh, is it when he's uh, fighting Campy? It is when he's fighting his father. Oh, it's when he's fighting Kronos. Yeah, um, it's on page. It's actually a kind of small minor panel. It's on page fifty-eight, the first panel. There's um, Kronos totally wails him, and he goes flying into the top of a mountain. It's just yeah. this lightning bolt hitting the mountain. And that was, I pretty much took that from the issue of Thor when um, he's fighting Jormungand, the world serpent. Mm. It, was, it was all splash pages. It was like my favorite issue as a kid. I read this thing until it fell apart. And there's a shot where Thor gets hit, and he flies into a mountaintop. And just, it was a panel very similar to that. Actually, much more dramatic, but I couldn't quite rip it off exactly. <laughs> <laughs> another thing, another moment that I really, really uh, enjoyed in the book, and this goes back to this idea of capturing uh, like awesome power and heightened drama and soaring adventure, is when you have, and, and I think you said somebody uh, that like you were trying to design Zeus to feel like a surfer dude a little bit. Yeah, yeah, he's a he's a twenty one year old surfer dude. And so there's this shot of him taking off to fight against Kronos, and he's literally riding the lightning. He's like, like a yeah. surfer. He jumps up into the air, and you feel that energy in that moment. And that's the moment where like, the 11-year-old in me is freaking out. It's like, oh my gosh, this is the awesome adventure I always wanted to have. But, you know, it's like, so I'm, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about, because I know you, you put together the draft of Zeus very quickly. Um, yeah. Uh, do you run into any difficulties in parsing through, okay, 
where do I slow this down? Where do I speed this up? Obviously, battles, you're going to want to have that, those moments be like the awesome, you know, like really driving moments. But there's also moments where you got to like get through like, okay, and then Zeus was raised by a goat and he was drinking ambrosia, living in a cave. And like, how do you parse through when you're talking in a visual medium? Uh, do you have any like takeaways from your experience of doing these books of like how you sift through all of the data to deliver everything in a condensed clarified form does that make sense does that yeah that question? Zeus was weird Zeus did come out very quickly for me and like that was there was a lot of unconscious stuff going on there but um you know like I think in Olympians the way like the kind of method I do most Olympians novels is we have these elements where it's very novels graphic novels where there's elements where it's very um you know, very heightened god stuff you know, it's like boom, boom, boom. It's like, you know, big narration, big events happening. And then you'll turn the page and like the next sequence is very down to earth. And the gods will speak in a way that's very similar to our own vernacular. Particularly a character like Hermes, who I kind of have to fight for that. Like Hermes speaks exactly like a modern day person does. He calls mm -hmm. Zeus pop. <laughs> you know, he's always making snide little remarks. And I remember at first people were like, oh, are you really sure about this? Like it's, we're going from like, you know, we're talking like pseudo-biblical narration. It's like Charlton Heston should be reading this stuff. And then we go to like, you know, just dudes. I'm like, yeah, that's totally the way the series has to be. Um, yeah. And that, I think, helps sort of in that, uh, that parsing out of the information. Like, I have these two different storytelling ways which are ingrained in the series. So I can use the lofty narration to tell a lot of exposition, to go into the bits of Zeus being raised by a goat or whatever weird bits that... I don't know that I could transform that. Like, if I had, like, a six-page sequence of Zeus hanging out with Almathea, like, sucking on the goat's horns and getting nectar and just being, like, normal, that's kind of hard to stomach. But right. Zeus frolicking on the beach with a bunch of nymphs because he's, like, you know, Zeus is the ultimate power fantasy. Like, Zeus is what most people would be like if they had those powers, I think. Like, he just, he has a good time. So you mean we wouldn't be like Laurence Olivier with a long white beard and... Oh, no. Why not? Oh, and I love Sterling Sylvan. I love the original Clash of Titans, even though I think it's a terrible movie. <laughs> um, it's, you know, if you've ever, if anybody's ever seen me do my live presentation, I like spend like maybe like five minutes just going off on all the things that drive me nuts about Clash of the Titans. Like the Kraken, hello, that's not even Greek, it's like Norwegian. <laughs> and like, you know, there's so many things. But like, yeah, you know, here's my thing I always say about Zeus. Dude's immortal. Dude can look like anything he wants anybody he wants. He could be super as he could be like make Brad Pitt look ugly. And then he really loves girls. He chases around to ladies all the time. So would he ever look like Lawrence Olivier or Liam Neeson or would he look like a twenty one year old surfer dude? Yeah. And then right. you know everybody was yells, twenty one year old surfer dude from California. I'm like, damn right he would. That's <laughs> <laughs> like you know, it's great Sir Lawrence Olivier brought some great gravitas to the role, but come on man. You should be a hunk. Well, and that's another thing that you do in this this series too that uh, I think is is interesting is you're um, in discovering the characters' narrative arcs. You're also kind of approaching them in a way that is not I don't want to say untraditional uh, because you're going from source material. You're not I don't think you're bringing anything. You're not writing new data into there, but you're 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 spinning it in different ways based on the available data. Like for instance, yeah. the play. Theseus is a jerk in Poseidon. Theseus is a total jerk. He's just an ass. <laughs> when I was a kid, he was my favorite. And I couldn't stand Hercules, or Heracles. And by doing those two books, I like I love Heracles now. I'm like Heracles is just this really put upon guy who does the best he can. He's not so smart, yep. but he tries. And then Theseus is just just a cruel jerk. And there's stories I left out of there of just him being a jerk. I think it's going to be a theme. Like, he'll thread into other stories just being evil. You know who Ayn Rand's favorite Greek hero was? Theseus. Oh, it's got to be Theseus, right? It's Theseus, yeah, because he yeah, was... It makes a lot of sense. Because <laughs> he's cool and calculating and, you know, ambitious, incredibly ambitious. He's, he's cold. He's just, he's, yeah, he's, he's hardcore. Yeah, yeah. I, like, I, I forgot about that whole bit where he leaves Ariadne on the beach and is like, I'll see you later, and then... Just... He doesn't even give her the see you later. He leaves her there. But you know what? That's going to... Uh, spoiler alert. In the last book, you'll see that ends. It has a happy ending for Ariadne, so... 
Uh, cause that, that was a pretty sad scene, especially the moment yeah. that you chose to show as she's waiting on the beach, but, uh, she waits there for years, but you know, she, somebody better comes along for her. But, but going back to Clash of the Titans, you know, it's like, like when I think of that movie and I think of a lot of Greek, uh, st- interpreted Greek stories, Hera's always played as a shrew. Hera is always, you know, like now Zeus, you know, <laughs> I gotta go punish another mortal because you were, you know, uh, infidelitous and, and all that stuff. You play her different too, with, with all available data. Yeah, Hera is, uh, Hera is my favorite goddess. Um, when I was a kid, I always kind of had the feeling like, you know, they don't treat Hera right. Like, I understood it, but like, I'm like, that, I think she acts out, but, you know, she's got the worst husband who ever existed. It kind of makes sense. But while doing the research for this and really kind of going back and reading the really old myths, uh, a lot of which we only have like little pieces of, like there's a line I put in Hera where it talks about the myths that the women told nobody wrote down. And that's absolutely true. Like, you know, Hera was an incredibly important divinity. And she had a much better reputation. We learn about her mostly through the, the, the lens of Heracles. And he was a pretty, his followers were really sexist. Like, Heracles was like the only god who wouldn't allow women in their temples. Well, you know, it's not Heracles' fault. It was, you know, his worst It's very macho. So we hear all these stories about Hera being this jerk. But there's all these weird myths that survive. Like Hera breastfeeding Heracles as a kid. I'm like, oh, that's a really interesting thread. So I followed up in that. I'm like, you know, she's more about toughening him up to make him prove himself worthy than being this evil, vengeful woman or goddess. So, yeah, yeah. So that's another thing to look forward to in reading these books, too, is that you're going to get a fresh take on these guys that isn't invented but more um, reconstructed. Does that sound fair to say? Yeah, I think it's actually, in a way, it's more traditional. So many, we know so much of what we know of the myths is characters assembled by modern day retellings. And, uh, you know, someone like Robert Graves, he made a few choices to tell these stories that most people know as the gospel now. But if you go back and read the myths that he actually read, there's a lot of different things that you could get out of them that he didn't necessarily choose to bring. I like that you said, like, the reassembling. It's like, there's different elements you could choose to spotlight. And he spotlighted one way, or, you know, Edith Hamilton spotlighted another way, or even the Dallaire's. They spotlight it a certain way. But there's a lot of stuff out there if you go back and read it, which you're like, oh, but there's this other version that you could use here. You traveled to Greece as well, did you not, yeah. to, to, to do research for this? Yeah, um, and actually I, I had an apartment in, in Rome for a while and kind of went out like anywhere where I could go where there was ancient Greek stuff or ancient Greek cities. and you know, it, was, it was pretty cool. That was a big thing that changed my mind. You go and you see these places where the gods were actually worshipped mm. and you you encounter like a really different take of things that's actually one of the things that really changed my mind about Hera you would go to virtually any old Greek town and almost invariably the oldest temple would be built to Hera before anybody else mm. like she was the most important goddess before even Zeus and then a lot of these same towns the second oldest temple would also be built to Hera so she was so important to them that she would get two temples before anyone else even got one. I'm like, that says something there. That's really interesting. We don't get that feeling from a lot of these stories. So research had a pretty, I mean, granted, you, this subject matter demands research, right? And, you know, the other books that you've done have demanded some kind of research. But what, what, what I'm picking up in there that I think is interesting is the story changed as a result of your research and and wonder if that's something that more cartoonists should be investigating when they're even when they're doing a fantasy story saying if this city is based loosely on this other city perhaps i should go there and do my proper research to see where how it will affect my story uh, i think it can only help really um if i just work strictly out my imagination i am limited by my imagination but if you do research, if you just read up on a subject, no matter what it is, you can pull on the, you know, the composite knowledge of everything that's ever been written or in, discovered or whatever about this thing. And there's going to be a few insights, a few details, a few things that you're not going to come up with by yourself. And so that could, that, I mean, it was something that was just instilled in me as a kid. Like, I, luckily, I like to research. I'm a guy when I read a book, I follow up in the notes in the back. It's a book I really like, and I read some more. That's how Mohawk Country came about. Yeah. I read a book called um, The Island at the Center of the World, and I read in the notes about this journal of Harmon van den Bogart. And I went and read that because I'm like, this is really cool. 
and you'll always find out these new details and information, and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't hurt. Yeah, yeah, and so the, this, I want to backtrack a little bit to this idea of finding the the narrative of the heroes in your stories, and lumping this in with the research question. How does that, like, when you're doing Poseidon and you're trying to do all these stories that are about this middle child who has yeah. something to prove, how did that change, or did it? Uh, the the writing of the story like w you're starting out with draft one you're starting out with your first thumbnailed notes and then you say well besides the middle child I want to express that does that have any effect on the final execution of the story yeah um, I don't know if you've heard this because I've mentioned this elsewhere but Poseidon was a particularly hard book for me to write um, I knew that I knew I wanted to go with the approach he was the middle child and I knew he was kind of inscrutable He's like, he's super duper famous. Everybody knows Poseidon, even people who don't know Greek myths. Mm. Um, everybody knows what he looks like, or so they think. Um, and he's in a lot of big stories, but he's never really, he's very rarely the center of the story. He's always kind of there being angry or something. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay. So I decided early on, I made a big spreadsheet of all what the proposed lineup for all 12 books and what stories would be in it and how I would tell them when I first started the series. And I always knew I was going to tell Poseidon from Poseidon's point of view to see if we could understand him better and to see if I could understand better because he was hard. So I wrote the entire first draft of this thing, which includes, you know, doing thumbnails because I have to do them both at the same time. Not even thumbnails, like a dummy. So I drew out little pictures and wrote the whole thing. And I finished the book and it stunk. I'm like, this is awful. I don't have any insight into Poseidon. I wrote this like me pretending to be Poseidon. It just sucks. So then I throw the whole thing out which really blew, because, you know, deadlines are coming up, too. And I'm like, I need to take this from a completely different angle. Let me write this from the point of view of somebody who is, like, his polar opposite. So I wrote, rewrote the book from the point of view of Athena, who is, he has kind of static with. And I had the same problem. I, I wrote it, I'm like, you know, she doesn't understand him either. Why, you know, they would probably get along better if she understood him. So I kind of threw that one out. I only got about two-thirds of the way through that one, actually. And then I, the third time, by going through this process... And trying to get inside his head for so long, and then being inside his arch enemy's head, I finally understood what made him tick. I'm like, oh my god, yes, this is it. So the third time, I finally got it out, and it was. I, I, I've had this effect a lot. Not an effect. This. Um, I, I've had this happen a lot with Olympians, where I'm kind of working in the process, and then like a revelation will come. And with beside it was something like, oh, I get it. I get why he's the way he is, and it all makes. It's weird because. I'm just telling these old stories. I don't know if the ancient Greeks had these things in mind, but it certainly fits as if he was a real person or a real being, that he would feel these ways. And it's great when you can apply this logic of the way people really react to these old stories and have it all knit together into this cohesive story that actually makes sense. So Poseidon, it took a while to do that. But yeah, it definitely changes the way I tell the story. I love this line. I'm gonna, this is going to be one of the things that I'm going to be quoting a lot on future Comics or Great episodes is you said, me pretending to be Poseidon sucked, right? <laughs> I was pretending to be Poseidon, and it sucked. You know, there's a difference. Because like, like one of the things, I teach a lot of comics classes, and one of the things I try to get, to get adults drawing, because adults who haven't drawn comics before, it's such a scary proposition for them, is I say, yeah. look, when you were eight and you're on the playground and you say, I'm a lizard man, I got a deflector shield, you just start pretending and you start making stuff up. And a kid can do it, you can do it, just pretend. But to, when you start bringing craft into it, when you want to start making something that matters, pretending isn't enough, is it? You got to get inside of them. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, you have to really, like, the characters really do write themselves if you do it right. And, like, for me, I'm sure there's bits of these books that are phoned in. Um, I someone will point them out to me someday. I'm like, yeah, but I really I try to work it until the characters are speaking. Until I, I try not to impose my will on them so much as just by immersing myself in this and just kind of reading all I can and just drawing and just thinking about it and just like you know just musing on these characters, being like, wow, you know, really old characters, like thousands of years old. If you go into the proto versions of them, even older, you know, like you can trace the lineage of some of these characters back like 5,000, 6,000 years. Um, it's really cool when things start speaking to you about that. Um, it took a while with Poseidon, but like when I did Aphrodite, it came out a bit quicker for me. Like I really, seeing her as the one who married into the, the, the dysfunctional family. Yeah. Uh, you know, that really helped a lot. Like she's, and seeing like, you know, she's, 
super duper powerful in a weird way. She's not like picking up mountains and throwing at people, but she can make Zeus do whatever he, she wants, for instance. So he's incredibly threatened by her. And then she has a weird power struggling with Athena and Hera, too, which, you know, there's so many cool little details that I could just pull on and like, be, what would it be like to be this super powerful being who marries into this family of super powered lunatics? <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's like the X-Men got nothing on those guys. Yeah. <laughs> I want to get at, uh, and that, folks are in the chat room and they're commiserating with you on the whole chucking things out in earlier drafts of what, what a painful experience that is. Uh, but that's all part of the bag, right? It's like when, you know, like the, to quote Charlton Heston, we mentioned Charlton Heston earlier, you know, if the wine is sour, throw it out, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, that's part of the gig. But I also want to, and I'm going to hold this up for you, the scene I'm talking about. Uh, the, ah, yes. The Minotaur, the, the Labyrinth. I'm a big fan of comics that do things. Th when, when somebody expresses something in a comic that you couldn't do in any other medium, any other uh, you know, film or prose, whenever comics gets to say, hey, look what I can do, I get very, very excited about it. But sometimes, and I'm guilty of this myself, sometimes cartoonists do it at in inappropriate times where you're just being showy and saying, like, look what comics can do without saying, look what comics can do, and this was the exact moment to do it. Now, here's the scene with Theseus going into the Hopefully lab. Hopefully that's not me being showy. No, no, because this is the book. As I'm, I'm reading this in bed last night and is brushing up on the book before the show, and I'm like, I'm waking up my wife. I'm like, look at this, look at this, look at what he did here. This is so cool. And, and she's ready for the showy thing because she's seen me get too excited about this in the past. And then she looks at it and she's like, oh, God, that's really good. <laughs> so, yeah, he, you, because you structured the panels in such a way. And I'm sorry for the folks who are listening in the audio. It's kind of hard to describe what this, what's going on here. But you've got the page segmented in such a way that we're getting these really quick snippets of the different organization and design of the different aspects of the labyrinth. But you've also segmented in a way that it really shows how you, you've designed it to where my eye gets lost in this. So I'm lost with Theseus in this scene, right? It's, yeah, it's breaking the, it's like the different concentric views of the Minotaur and you keep going, uh, the, the labyrinth. And you keep going through different versions, like different areas of mazes. And there's a little red line you could follow through the whole thing. Yeah. And then his encounter with the actual Minotaur is the same way. Like you turn the page. It's two double page spreads. Yeah. And then there's just the shot of him finding the Minotaur, which is like a double page spread of these weird concentric panels. You really get glimpses of the fight. And then uh, <laughs> I, actually did, I drew this, I remember. It ends on the next page, right? Very abruptly. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, right there. And it was a pretty gruesome shot of sword in the throat. That was kind of out of necessity. Um, in an early version of the first draft, not even the version I threw out, um, that sequence was much bigger. And it's such a fun sequence to illustrate. I was being incredibly self-indulgent. You know, a lot of him walking through the labyrinth, and then him finding the Minotaur went on for like five or six pages. And that was just too long to tell a side story about Theseus, you know, Poseidon's son. I'm like, this is really beside the story. I gotta really use some economy, some clarification. Yeah, kind of, there we go. <laughs> and so I kind of like, how do I get the feeling of walking through an endless maze without actually drawing pages and pages of walking through an endless maze? Well, maybe this way. It, it hurt. It hurt to do that. Th this whole book was full of pain. <laughs> I really wanted to draw. Like, I was very happy with my design of Minotaur. I wanted to draw him just whooping the hell out of Theseus for pages. I'm like, yes. You know, I used to do it all the time as a kid. It was my fa he was my single favorite monster to draw was the Minotaur. Wow. And it's kind of the way I drew him as a kid. It's a design that's evolved with me over the years. Uh, but, you know, sometimes less is more. And it was just, that seems to be one of the sequences of the book that people really respond to well. So I think I made the right decision. I think you did. Because, like I said, like, it, it doesn't only expedite the storytelling, but it gives this kind of winding sense, the way you constructed the, that double-page spread. And then when, you do, when you've got that, the, the repeat performance of that double-page spread uh, in, in the final battle with the Minotaur, oh, yeah. right, you've constructed it in such a way where you're using every square inch of that page to fit as much data in there where we follow... Let me see if I can get my hand on the right side. We follow these L-shaped panels to get all of the important... You, you put everything in a, in a place where you're maximizing the use of the, the space. So it's an L-shaped panel, but it's not just an L-shaped panel just for the sake of doing something weird, right? It's not... No, yeah, there's, it's, it's, 
don't know. That's one of the things I really love about comics. Um, you mentioned that you've taught comics, and I used to teach comics as well. And I found that was one of the best things I could ever have done for myself because somehow articulating these things made me realize stuff. And there's so much you can do with comics about like where you place things in the shape of a panel, where you put the word bubbles. The way you can control, that sounds a little domineering, but the way you can control the way that somebody's eye moved over the page, that really is something only comics can do. And that is one of the great strengths of comics, putting more words or details in. Or yeah. speed them up by making it less detailed or no words. Just, it's pretty fun. Yeah, no, that that's and that's why I get excited when I see a cartoonist who you, who leverages that that power effectively. So that another reason to read these books, even if you're like a a formalist nerd like me. Uh, we're we are we are not gonna do book recommendations this time. We're coming up on oh. uh, on the end, but we we can fit some in if you want to do some. It's just that my my librarian compatriot is not gonna be able to make it to the show. But I will say for folks who are watching the Ann Arbor area, these books are in the collection, so you can check them out today, or you can go to your finer uh, comic book store to get some. I want to make sure that we get time to talk about the Thunderers a little bit. <gasps> Wait, is that online? <laughs> no, no. It's not online, but I, I, I do my research, and I found out that you had this awesome comic when you were uh, in, in middle school called The Thunderers, which sounds amazing, and i got to read it. I should post that up. Uh, Thunderers, okay. Um, it's so funny you brought this up because it's totally tied it in. Um, <laughs> like, the big bad guy in Thunderers had a skull for a head. Awesome. He was Skeletor. Um, <laughs> one of the guys is totally Major Blood from G.I. Joe. Um, it was like, it was this synthesis. You could totally see all these influences we talked about, like these things I was into as a kid, like He-Man. And then my, myth my love for mythology. And then I'm just getting into Simonson at this point. So this is the first thing I've, I've, I've gotten into. I've been devouring Simonson. I was getting to Charles Vest. He was doing some cool stuff oh, at the yeah. same time. Oh. And this is me creating this, like, it was like, a, basically, it was a superhero Viking book. <laughs> Set back in the day of Vikings, all the Vikings had different abilities. There was, um, there was one guy with lightning, because he was, you know, whatever. It was, I think it was Leaf. There was a guy who had, like, a robot arm, like a techno-punk arm that he could, like, shoot out, and it was on a cord. Um, there was a magician guy. There was a guy who could control fire. And then there was all these bad guys. And it was designed to be like, uh, I, I don't know, yeah, I used to go home and do that every, like, my friends would be like, hey, come out and play. I'm like, oh, gotta draw Thunderers. And it was, uh, <laughs> it was designed to be like a, like a one-page comic. Because my big influence, which I always get short-shifted in these things, uh, I was really into comic strips. Mm. Um, more so than comics for many years. And I think that's kind of why I have a silly side in my stuff. Like, I was really into, like, Bloom County and Calvin and Hobbes and The Far Side and such. So I really like the format of doing a comic strip. So Thunders was designed to be like weekly installments of like an adventure comic that wasn't lame like Prince Valiant. <laughs> Sorry, Prince Valiant. <laughs> but when I was a kid, I'm like, why is that guy wearing lipstick? You know? <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it now, but I'm like, oh my God, this is the worst comic I've ever seen. So I was trying to do my own version. Um, I should yeah. really dig that stuff up and post it online. Oh, like, do... God. I just want you to make a new comic out of it, because that sounds amazing. That sounds like something I would totally just want to... I... Yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe I should. I don't know. It Here's the be... picture it... of Philip J. Fry saying, here, take my money, please. You know, after you're done with the Olympians... <laughs> take my money! <laughs> after you're done with the Olympians, please do the Thunders. That sounds incredible. Uh, huh. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. Oh. That would actually be pretty fun. I know I'd love to read it, especially with, you know, like all of uh, the soaring adventure that you capture in the Olympians, plus with that wonderful, wonderful, you know, irreverent kid logic of, yeah, we're Vikings in Viking times, but we all have some kind of superpower and we fight yeah, face monsters. That's the best. That's the best. <laughs> no, I, I, so many bad guys because of like, again, He-Man and like Cobra. I was so always into the bad guys. Couldn't give a crap about the Joes. But, like, you know, Major Blood and Destro, those guys are awesome. <laughs> All Major Blood ever did was scream. And like, Major Blood, <laughs> go do that thing over there. And he screams, what does he scream? Cobra. And every time he leaves yeah. the room, he screams Cobra. That's a, that's a passionate man. And uh, then his plane gets blown up, and then he parachutes up. <laughs> <laughs> it's like... <laughs> Every time. <laughs> the, the new G.I. Joe movie is exceedingly cartoony, and I know that not everybody likes it, but if, if they just would have added a parachute out of a plane in one scene, I would have, you know, been on cloud nine. But. We have this discussion at my studio. I have a studio with a bunch of other comic artists, and I maintain that the G.I. Joe movie sucks. And, uh, oh, wait, were, were we talking the original one or the new one? The new ones. The, the... Oh, the new one. I can't even know. Nobody in my studio would support that. That was, like, 
such a pile of garbage. <laughs> Holy <laughs> cow. I, I, Cobra Commander is, is, is super boring in the movie, but I, I thought that it was, it was cartoony enough that it felt like kind of like the original series to me. Like the way that the, the, the problem is resolved in the end of the new film is like right out of the 80s Sunbow cartoon. But, I do. The one scene I really remember that more than anything is the shot where the one guy, Heavy Duty, they just zoom in him going, yo, Joe. And he was so, the actor was so not into it. He's yeah. like, oh, God, where's my paycheck? Let me get out of this movie. <laughs> well, yeah, and, and they zoom out. He's like in the submarine, yelling "Yo, Joe!" I'm like, "Oh man, this movie is awful." And, 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 and yeah, and they do the thing with Cobra Commander where he's got like the Cookie Monster voice, which is just like, "Oh, really? Come on, can we just get a fish shaking villain just once and not have a guy who's just always the seething Cookie Monster voice villain?" But I hear the new one, they do him right, but uh, he looks you know, right. He looks right, but he's still doing the whole. I talk like this. And I'm like, ah, oh, you know, it's like. Do you it, like the uh, the old voice, the the old hissy voice? I do, I do. I I, yeah, I, I I like villains who aren't afraid to be flamboyant about being. Have bad. you ever um? This is really geeky. Have you ever heard of the podcast uh, Super Ego? Yeah, yeah. All right, Super Ego is like my favorite podcast. All it's like improvised comedy. They did in one of their episodes. They did a GI Joe roll call, where it's just like it's like Duke sounding like Duke, who's the biggest douche in the world, just being like, "All right, Joes." Sound off! And then one of the Joes is Cobra Commander in disguise. And whoever does it does the best Cobra Commander voice I've ever heard. I get so excited every time I hear it. It's it? hilarious. Everybody should look this kid up. Because some of the, like, it's all these ridiculous... Because, you know, the Joes over-specialized after a while. And it's like, all these ridiculous guys like could grow, like, herb gardens. Or one guy who was tied to a chair and set a fire by Destro. Very dark, but funny in the comic. We, <laughs> we'll link to it in the show notes. The Super Ego Show. <laughs> but, um... But okay, well, did you have any other book recommendations that you wanted to throw in at the end? Besides, I mean, you know, it's all about the Olympics. I think Olympics. I mentioned Walt Simonson enough, right? Yeah, Walt Simonson. Other books that are big influences on me, um, uh, I would say Neil Gaiman's Sandman series. I think that's probably the other book you could look at and see where my writing was really influenced by that. Um, I'm looking at my bookshelf right now. You know what the series Dungeon? Oh, my gosh, by Trondheim? Uh, uh, yeah, it's yeah. by uh, Juan Sfar and, um... and Tr Trondheim, isn't it? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Jeez, I'm like, yeah, the guy who named himself River City. That's like really great. Oh, Love and Rockets. Yeah. I don't know. Okay, Love and Rockets. That's me supporting. They're all, you know, they're all doing good. But but yeah, Dungeon is fantastic. It is so so funny, and it's yeah, like a mix of funny and like high adventure and real heartbreaking pathos and. God, such and this is like such a delight to read and just like I mean, there's a lot of different artists who've worked on it, but there's that kind of most of them fit into this one style where it's just kind of loose but yet detailed and it's just brilliant stuff. Yeah, so we'll link to that in the show notes as well. And then I want to throw out one more thing at the end: uh, Astronaut Academy Day, May 14th. Uh, you can go to comicsagreat.com slash AA Day. Dave Roman's book Astronaut Academy is coming out for first second May 14th. We've got a contest going on. Uh, on comicsforgate.com where you can win almost a thousand pages of digital comics, uh, an original portrait of you by Raina Telgemeier. Uh, we've got uh, an original drawing. Oh, I thought it was Dave that drew the portrait. Oh, no, no, Raina's going to draw the portrait. I wanted to be Dave because he just does the two eyes in the mouth. <laughs> Dave, you are know, you watching? about Dave Roman? Yeah. I don't think he's even a Roman. <laughs> I think I, I he's think, living a lie. I, I think he's actually from Crete. But uh, <laughs> but uh, but then you've got an original drawing by Kazu Kibuishi of the Amulet characters, which is a prize in there. Uh, copy signed and uh, uh, sketch versions of G-Man by Chris Russo are prizes in there. And I just added uh, a free Skype workshop with me at your school or library, so any educators or librarians watching, uh, th that's in there as well. And also a bunch of other stuff that's at comicsregate.com slash Day. And uh, let's try to get the buzz going for the release of Astronaut Academy on May 14th. Get your picture taken with the book, write a blog, or just do some fan art. Share the link on Twitter with the Astronaut Academy tag, and you are entered to win one of those awesome prizes. And you're doing a good thing by supporting a really important book for kids coming out in, in May. Yeah, that's, that's some pretty awesome prizes. Oh, thanks, man. Uh, it's, it's all the other cartoonists who are contributing to this thing. So, um, final word. Final word, uh, George. Uh, thank you so much for making time to be on the show. Anything else that we missed that you wanted to throw out a, a notification about? Gosh, um, pretty thorough. Um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, if you're in the New York City area, I'm doing a signing at Books of Wonder this Sunday, I want to say. 
with a bunch of other people, including who I mentioned before, Charles Vess. Very excited about that. Wow. Um, and then... Um, Books of Wonders, your old stomping grounds, isn't it? Yeah, Books of Wonders, where I, I worked in. I worked there while I was in school, and then for a few years afterwards too. So we'll have to have you back. Uh, a lot on of people talk came about. from there. Actually, in Ann Arbor's own Erin Stead. Oh, really? Uh, she, you know, she won the Caldecott a couple yeah. of years back. Yeah. She, uh, we knew each other there too. Um, and then the weekend after. Oh, the weekend after that, I'm doing the Authors Unlimited thing on Long Island. Where it's a bunch of great authors for kids. We all get together. Uh, we appear at St. Joseph's College. It's free. We give uh, workshops all day, and we're going to be signing books and such. It's really fun. Cool. So, and yeah. it, this is all on your blog, yes? Uh, not yet, but it will be. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, people could go to olympiansrule.com or Olympians. I just put it up like a couple of days before. I guess I'm probably due to put up the, uh, the uh, Books of Wonder thing. Okay, and and uh, yeah, Olymp olympiansrule.blogspot.com is the blog, yeah. yeah, and then or follow him on Twitter, George underscore O'Connor underscore. And so, I'm taking suggestions for a better name. Oh, for a Twitter <laughs> handle? Yeah, you know the underscores. It's very confusing. Yeah, well, yeah, that's 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 the world we live in now with so many names being taken. But uh, we'll have to have you back on to talk about your, your books of wonder years and how what you gained from working there because there was some pretty interesting stories in there that we didn't get to about what yeah, you yeah, I'd love to. It's like it's authors. crazy. Everyone I worked with is like in kids books now. It's we're like uh, my editor calls us the books of wonder mafia. <laughs> But everybody, uh, do do go check out his blog and do check out his book, uh, the Olympian series, Zeus, Poseidon, uh, Hades, and Hera, and soon to come out, Aphrodite, and, then, and Athena. Don't forget Athena. And Athena. I cannot forget about Athena. But thank you, George. This was awesome. This was really, really great. Uh, yeah, thank you. This was really fun. All right, so this show will be archived at comicsagreat.com slash CAG76. You can follow us up on YouTube at comicsagreat.tv. You know, you can give the videos a thumbs up. That might be nice, help people find out about the show. Give us a review on iTunes if you listen to the audio show. You can also get the videos and download them from comics.aadl.org. And until next time, oh, next week we're going to have Tony Cliff, another first, second author, uh, along with uh, Chris and Shane Houghton of Reed Gunther, and we're going to talk about doing action sequences in comics. It should be a fun one, so do check us out in two weeks, May 1st, 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time. So until then, I have been Jersey Droz of comicsagreat.com and Jersey on Twitter. Okay, bye.